Hi guys, this week we're moving on and we're going to be covering chapter three. So remember, we kind of jump around a lot. Um, don't get confused. We're going to be jumping to chapter three. So we did 10 last week and now we're going to move to three. Um, what we're going to do this week is we're going to start talking specifically about the police procedures of um, stop, uh, search and seizure. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint. And what we're going to do today is we're going to really dive into the Fourth Amendment. So the Fourth Amendment has lots of different parts to it. So we're really going to spend some time going step by step through the Fourth Amendment so you know exactly what um, is expected out of the Fourth Amendment. Now, there's a little video. It's Crash Course with Criminal Procedure. Um, it gives you kind of a great overview of this, so I recommend you watch this. It might give you some information um, that I may forget to tell you, or just like kind of a good overview. So when you start to watch this, you'll have some understanding of what I'm saying. Okay, so the first question I want to ask is, what does the Fourth Amendment protect against? So that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. We have this Fourth Amendment, and we want to know what is it actually protecting against? So hopefully you remember the Fourth Amendment. Like, why do we have the Fourth Amendment in our Constitution? And hopefully you remember that the Fourth Amendment is in the Constitution in order to protect us against unlawful searches and seizures. So that's going to be the first police procedure that we start to talk about. We're going to talk about the search and seizure. Now, before we go any further, it's really important for you to understand that the first thing that you always need to figure out is, is there governmental action? So the Fourth Amendment, the constitutional amendment, only protect you against governmental action, right? So like even the First Amendment, free speech, private people can discriminate against you for your speech. It's only what the government does it against you. So the first question is always going to be, is the government conducting an unlawful search and seizure? So you always have to start with that question. Is there governmental action? Is it somebody in the government that's violating your Fourth Amendment um, rights against unlawful search and seizures, okay? So then the question is, what if a private citizen turns over seized information to the police? So in, if it's not the police that find the evidence, what if it's a private citizen that goes and finds the evidence? Can we still use that evidence against the defendant at trial? And this came up in a court case called Bordeaux versus McDowell. And in Bordeaux versus McDowell, the Supreme Court said that the Fourth Amendment only applies to governmental actions, not to private citizens. So if a private citizen conducts a search and seizure and then just turns that evidence over to the police, then that's not governmental action and there's no Fourth Amendment protection. Now, if they trespassed or they burglarized or they did something to get that evidence, then it could be problematic. But it's not going to be excluded under the exclusionary rule because there's no governmental action. OK, so remember, Bordeaux comes up quite a bit. So always remember, we first have to have governmental action. OK, so what if the private citizen is acting on behalf of the government? So what if the police call the wife or girlfriend or friend and say, go get this out of the person's house? Does that qualify as governmental action? And the courts have said, maybe it could if you are directed by the government to do it. So a couple factors we look at to determine if it qualifies as an agent of the government or governmental action. The first thing is, did the government know of and acquiesce to the activity? So did the government know this was going to occur and did they like allow it? OK, and was the citizen motivated by the government to assist the government? So did the government encourage the citizen to do it? So if the police are encouraging it, then that is going to qualify as governmental action and the Fourth Amendment protections will kick in because that person would be acting as an agent of the government, okay? So if you qualify as an agent of the government, then that qualifies as governmental action and the Fourth Amendment protections then kick in. 
So they do not kick in if there's no governmental action, but if you have governmental action, those protections kick in. Okay, so what do you think about this? Officer Clark is a sworn policeman by day and a private security guard at night. One night while on duty in the parking lot outside a major retail store, Clark witnesses Lenore Rand, a patron whom he suspected of shoplifting, leaving the store. Clark confronts Rand, sees her bag, and discovers several items that she had not paid for. The incident was reported and the evidence was turned over to the police. Can Rand mount a Fourth Amendment challenge to Clark's actions? So Clark is a police officer but not one at the time, it's just a security guard. So we have to then decide, is a security guard a governmental actor or is a security guard just a private person? And the Supreme Court had to make these decisions. So it can get tricky. So what the list is kind of right now, according to the Supreme Court, if you're a uniformed police officer, it's governmental actor. If you work for a health or safety regulatory agency and you're an officer, fire inspection, OSHA, federal mine inspectors, teachers were governmental workers, um, private persons working for the government, those all qualify as governmental actors and the Fourth Amendment protections will apply. Ones we're not quite sure on, private security, security guards, insurance inspectors, the Supreme Court has not conclusively decided those ones yet. And then private citizens, private people are never going to <clears throat> be governmental actors and the Fourth Amendment protection would not apply to them. Okay, so once we get by that requirement, once we get past the idea that they are governmental actors, then the next question is when um, you have to see once you get by the requirement that there is governmental action, then you have to see if the search and seizure falls within the Fourth Amendment. So first we decide if you're a governmental actor. If you're a governmental actor, then we say, okay, the Fourth Amendment applies. So then we have to go through a step-by-step -step analysis to determine if what's going on falls within the protections of a Fourth Amendment search and seizure. So that's what we're going to do for the rest of this class. We're gonna go through what is actually protected by the Fourth Amendment. So this is your Fourth Amendment. You don't have to write it down. The Fourth Amendment, you can Google it as Cersei, Cer 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 you know what's her name? <laughs> That's Game of Thrones. You can ask um, what the Fourth Amendment is. It's always there, so you don't need to write it down, okay? Siri, that's what it is. So the Fourth Amendment, the right of persons to be secured in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So we're gonna go through this step-by-step -step and talk about what each part means, okay? So the first thing says a person, the right of a person to be secured in their person. So we know by reading the Fourth Amendment, if there's governmental action, then we know a person, their body, anything on their body, their person is protected by the Fourth Amendment. So any searches of a person where they search in pockets or look in, on anything on their person is going to be protected by the Fourth Amendment. Okay, so that's expressly protected by the Fourth Amendment. The next one is houses. So your house is also going to be expressly, explicitly protected by the Fourth Amendment. Okay, so this means the actual house that you live in. We're going to talk about what goes beyond that later, but the actual house that you live in. What the courts have said too is if you own a business, your business also is going to be classified as a house. So your business, there could be some rules that we'll talk about, but in general, a business is similar to a house and would be protected. We know papers are and effects are also protected. So papers are obviously actual papers, documents, and then effects are anything you can touch, okay? So this pencil is an effect. My glasses are an effect. Anything you can touch, a folder is an effect. Anything you can touch would be your effect. So when we read this Fourth Amendment, we clearly know persons' bodies are protected, houses are protected, documents are protected, 
and any effects. So purses, bags, all of those kind of things are all effects. Cars, they are all going to be protected. Okay. So that's the first thing we have to remember the specific things that are protected. So there was a question that came up in 2009. What about data on a computer? Is that considered an effect? So if you find a computer hard drive and there's data on that, do we consider the data an effect? Because you can't touch a data. Like I can touch this pencil and it's an effect, but I actually can't touch data. It's just data on a computer. So this went to the second circuit in 2009. Remember the second circuit is our circuit where we are in Western New York. And the Supreme Court said, yes, a computer hard drive, the data on that computer hard drive is similar to like a house, okay? And so therefore it is protected, it is protected information because it can contain a lot of personal information. So obviously the computer might be protected, but the data on it is also protected. Data on a computer will be considered an effect. Now, remember, this is only the second circuit the Supreme Court could decide something different if they wanted, but right now it's only a second circuit. So where we live, it is protected, okay? So when you looked at the Fourth Amendment now, our first question is, is there governmental action? And then in order to have Fourth Amendment protection, it has to be a search in a protected area. So we clearly just said that the areas that are expressly protected by the Fourth Amendment our persons, houses, papers, effects. So from now on, when we're doing our Fourth Amendment analysis, which we're going to do over and over and over, first question, governmental action, and then is it expressly protected by the Constitution? And I'm going to ask you, what are the four areas expressly protected? And you're going to say persons, houses, papers, effects. So those are undoubtedly protected by the Fourth Amendment. They're expressly strict interpretation of the Fourth Amendment. They are protected. But if you're only looking at what's listed in the Constitution, so remember back we talked about strict constructionists, they only believe that the Constitution is what it says. We're not going to interpret more out of it. So if you're a strict constructionist and you have believe in a strict interpretation, those are the only four areas that are in fact protected, okay? So those are expressly protected, but maybe nothing else if you're a strict constructionist. So then what about this? The defendant's telephone was wiretapped without a warrant in violation of an alcohol, uh, to find violations of an alcohol law. So it was during prohibition. They wiretapped the phone to see if the person was selling alcohol illegally. The government collected more than 775 pages of notes from the wiretap and used that information to indict 70 people. So then we have to ask ourselves, is a telephone conversation, the actual conversation that people have with each other, is that protected by the Fourth Amendment? Okay. Now, remember, we just said a strict interpretation, the four areas that are protected, person, house, paper, effect. So is a telephone conversation a person, a house, a paper, or an effect? And that's what the Supreme Court had to decide. And in 1928, the Supreme Court said, no, a telephone conversation is not an effect or anything. And since it's not expressly listed in the Constitution, it's not protected. OK, so telephone conversations were not protected. And they came up with what was called the trespass doctrine. They said that an officer or the government has to specifically physically be present and trespass in an area that's protected on a person. So physically touch them or physically search papers, effects, houses. You have to physically invade or trespass those areas in order for it to be a violation of the Fourth Amendment, in order for it to be a search in a protected area. So telephone conversations did not count. Now, some of you are like, wait, I don't understand. I know that they have to have wiretaps. You have to get warrants. Well, that is how it existed for 39 years. It wasn't until 1967 when the Supreme Court changed its mind. And in Katz v. Uh, U.S., what happened is there was a 
a man that they suspected of gambling and using a, a, t- a telephone phone booth. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen them. There are not too many of them around anymore with cell phones, but they would have actual telephone booths that you could go in. I think there was a movie made where there's a sniper um, and you can make a phone call. So what the um, FBI was doing is they attached a listening device to the telephone booth and was listening into the conversations Katz was making. So then we ask ourselves, how is this analogous or distinguishable from Olmstead? Well, it's analogous because it's a telephone conversation. So if you said a telephone conversation in Olmstead was not protected and you say this is analogous, you would probably determine that um, it is not protected and that the police could do that, put a listening device on a telephone booth. Or you could distinguish it, okay? You could say it's different. And you could say, well, this is different because they were actually attaching the listening device to a telephone booth. And therefore it was a trespass. So this went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court just decided to make a completely different test. So the Supreme Court said, yeah, you are right. Persons, houses, papers, and effects are the only four things that are expressly protected under a strict interpretation of the constitution. But we think that the founding fathers really wanted more things to be protected. So these were the living, breathing constitutional judges who are going to expand on what they interpret that the founding fathers really wanted. And they said that, or they created what's called the expectation of privacy test. So the expectation of privacy test says not only are person's houses, papers, and effects protected, but anything a reasonable person would expect to be private is also protected by the Fourth Amendment. So this greatly expanded the protection of the Fourth Amendment. So originally, the only four things, person's houses, papers, effects were protected. Once they created CATS, it created a huge amount of additional things that could be protected under the expectation um, of privacy test. So remember we had the exclusionary rule and then we had fruit of the poisonous tree that made it much bigger. Same thing here. We had the four express areas that were protected. Now we have cats, which greatly expands what receives fourth amendment protections. Now, in order for you to meet this test, in order for something to qualify as private under the expectation of privacy test, you have to meet two things, right? So both of these have to be met before the court's gonna say it was an invasion of privacy. Number one, you have to subjectively, well, let me start with objective first. So you have to, um, objectively, a reasonable person would expect it to be private. So if you survey 100 people, everyone would say, oh, yes, we absolutely think that that should be private. That's the objective privacy test. Reasonable people would all agree that that should be private. And then subjective privacy is the actual person whose privacy it is has to believe that it should be private and is taking steps to keep it private, right? So a lot of people say, yes, a purse would be objective privacy. People would think a purse would, a reasonable person would think a backpack or a purse should be private. If you surveyed them all, they would all say, yes, it should be private. But if I'm wearing, I'm carrying a clear purse that you can see through, then I am subjectively not trying to keep it private. So not only does the reasonable person have to believe it should be private, the person whose privacy it is have to take steps and try to keep it private. You know, remember, you have to meet both parts of this test. If you don't satisfy both parts of this test, then you cannot pass this test and you do not receive the expectation of privacy. So no Fourth Amendment protection. Okay, so. Think about these examples. So if I search a purse, would a reasonable person expect it to be private? Yes. And if it's zipped and it's inside the purse, does that person subjectively keeping that purse private? Yes, okay. Please notice a gun through a clear purse. 
So still a purse would be objectively private. Reasonable persons would say it's private, but you didn't personally try to keep it private because you're carrying a clear purse. Therefore, it does not meet the subjective part of the test. And therefore, the police can grab the gun and it's not an unlawful search and seizure. Searching a home. So obviously, you would say yes. A reasonable person would expect their home to be private. Plus, it's expressly protected under the Constitution. But what if they see through the window? You have this huge window. The curtains are wide open. You're sitting right in front of the window and you're doing drugs. And the police just walk by on the street and see you doing drugs. So, yes, your house objectively would be private but you aren't taking proper steps to keep it private. So you would violate subjective part of the test, okay? So before I forget the word of this lecture for the key word for this lecture for this week is expectation of privacy, okay? So make sure you write that down. Expectation of privacy is the key word for this week. Okay, now, what about this? When do you have an expectation of privacy in certain areas, okay? So there are certain areas that courts have already made a decision on on whether or not you have an expectation of privacy. So let's look at the specific cases that the Supreme Court has already decided, okay? So we said telephone conversations. So according to Katz, do people have an expectation of privacy in their conversations, their telephone communications. And then we know in CATS, the Supreme Court said, yes, if you're in a telephone booth, you would have an expectation of privacy in that conversation, okay? So CATS equals private conversation between two non-consenting people. So CATS didn't know that they were video or um, audio recording it. And the person CATS was speaking to also did not know that they were recording that conversation. You had two private citizens, non-consenting, neither person in the conversation consented to it being recorded. So now what about this situation? John Quinn was put in jail as a homicide suspect. The prosecutor didn't think that she had enough evidence to go to trial, so she asks a police officer in street clothes to pose as a jail inmate and strike up a conversation with John. The officer was placed in the same cell as John and began to make small talk with him. Eventually, John mentioned that he was involved in the murder of, Val murder of Valerie Hutton, but that he was not the trigger man. So should John's statements be protected by the Fourth Amendment? So now we have one consenting person, the police officer, and one non-consenting person. John Quinn. So John Quinn is not agreeing to the police um, recording or listening to this conversation or the police officer. John Quinn doesn't even know about it. So now what if we have one consenting person and one non-consenting person? What happens in that situation? And that came up in Hoffa versus US. So remember it's analogous because it's a conversation but it's distinguishable from cats because cats had two non-consenting people. In Hoffa, the conversation said, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court said, the conversation may be protected under cats, but no expectation of privacy if one person consents. So as long as one person in the conversation agrees to have the police listen to it, then there's no expectation of privacy under CATS. So although CATS does protect conversations, all it takes is one of the people to agree to have the police listen, and then therefore it's going to be okay. Okay, so that's Hoffa. Now, there was another case very similar to this. It wasn't just a police officer listening in. This time, the police were actually recording the conversation. So it took it a step further. It just wasn't the police. It was actually a recording. So again, it's a conversation, which is analogous to cats. It's distinguishable because 
one of the parties is consenting for the police to record the conversation. Okay, it wasn't the police actually record. It wasn't the police engaging with White this time. It was a citizen, but this citizen said the police could record the conversation. And only one person said yes, not White. Supreme Court said it doesn't matter. They reaffirmed Hoffa. You have no expectation of privacy in your calls as long as one person consents to that conversation being recorded. And what the court said is you always face the consequences or possibility of false friends, which means you always run the risk that the person you're speaking to could be recording that conversation and disclosing it to the police. And as long as they agree to it, then it's okay. It's not a violation of the expectation of privacy test. So conversations would not be protected as long as one person agrees. Now, remember we said the Supreme Court makes the rule and that other states can give more protections. Well, this is a case where New York actually follows the Supreme Court. We only need one person to consent and then it's okay. Other states like Florida and I think California are two party consent. So the conversations cannot be recorded unless both parties agree. So in those two states, they give the defendant more protection than the Supreme Court. Supreme Court says only one party has to agree. Certain states say, no, 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 no. Both parties have to recognize that you are recording and both parties have to consent. So it's a little more protection than we would give in New York or under the federal system, okay? So those are conversations. Now let's move to a different subject, a different area that may or may not meet the expectation of privacy test. So what is the difference? I leave a McDonald's bag on the side of the road. Can the pol police search that bag? Or I leave my car in the parking lot and go to class. Can the police search my car? So the question is, are both of these properties that you left behind? And if you left it behind, does it then give the police authority to search it? So what would be the difference between these two? What would make one different from the other? So we have to distinguish between property that was meant to be left behind and property that you are expecting to go back to at some point. So that's really going to be one of the factors that affects your analysis. So to do that, we have to distinguish between what we call lost, misplaced, or abandoned property. If you just lose something or misplace it, that means you want it back. You want to go back to it. If it's lost or misplaced, that means you still have an expectation of privacy in that property. But if you've abandoned it, then it no longer has an expectation of privacy. Okay, so how would you know if it's lost or misplaced or if it's abandoned? Well, you can look at the nature of the object. A trash bag with only trash in it is more likely the courts are going to deem that as abandoned. Or if it's something like a car, obviously you're going to try to find your car and want it back. So that's going to be lost or misplaced. Okay, so that's the distinction. The Supreme Court said if they determine the property was lost or misplaced, it will receive Fourth Amendment protections. If it's just abandoned, then no expectation of privacy in that. Okay, and this came up around in the California versus Greenwood case. And this was garbage. So garbage was put in the garbage bin and then the garbage bin was rolled to the end of the street. So it was still on the person's driveway, but it was awaiting for the garbage truck. So the police go and they search the garbage and they argue it was abandoned. They were leaving it for the garbage truck to pick it up. And Greenwood said, no, 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 no. It still is expectation of privacy. It's my property, it's in my garbage can, you cannot search it. That is on my property. That is protected by the Fourth Amendment. The Supreme Court said, no, if it's abandoned, no expectation of privacy, and therefore it's no 
bad search. It's not a bad search. Okay. So it's not a bad search. And the court said, if you put your garbage at the end of the driveway, that is one of the factors that we know to show it was in fact abandoned. So how do we know it's abandoned? We look at all of the facts and circumstances surrounding it. What is it? Where was it? How was it left? You know, things like that. So the courts will look at all of the factors surrounding that piece of property and a judge would have to make a determination if it was lost or misplaced or if it's abandoned. If the judge determines it's abandoned, no expectation of privacy, no Fourth Amendment protection. Okay. So, and we now know the court said if the garbage is next to the house, it's going to be protected. But if it's down by the street, nope, it's abandoned. Okay. Now, what about open fields? Okay. So I live on a farm and I have 10 acres of property. So I know my house is protected. And another thing that is generally protected is what we call curtilage. Curtilage is the land immediately surrounding your house that you use for household purposes. So my personal house, I don't live on huge property. So I just have a small amount of property around my house. So my house would be protected and my whole yard would be curtilage. But let's say I did live on acres and acres of land. What about those other acres that I'm not using on a day-to-day -day basis? Are they still part of our property? Do that you still have an expectation of privacy on things that are on that land? So we know expressly the house and the curtilage, we know the house is expressly protected under the Fourth Amendment. We know the curtilage, the land surrounding the house is going to be protected under the expectation of privacy test. But what about these open fields? So John, Joe lives on 50 acres of property. He decides to grow marijuana in the middle of the property in order to hide it from the police. Can the police search this open field for marijuana? And the Supreme Court said, they can search. Yes, they can search. So what the Supreme Court said in 1924 and reaffirmed in Oliver in 1984 is open fields are not protected under the Fourth Amendment. You do not have an expectation of privacy on those open fields. You have it for your house. You have it for the land immediately surrounding your house. You do not have an expectation of privacy on all of these other open fields. We're not going to extend that protection that far. So how do we determine if it's curtilage close to the house or if it's an open field? The Supreme Court came up with a test and said, only if it's curtilage do you have an expectation of privacy. So how do we determine if it's curtilage? Well, we look at four factors. How far away is it from the house? So the closer to the actual physical house, the more protection it's going to have. Do you have a fence that's surrounding that property and you are trying to keep it private? If you have a fence, courts are going to more lean towards curtilage and protection. If you have no fence, they're going to be less likely to protect it. Number three, what are you using the land for? Is it for household things? Are you having picnics? Do you have a, um, a, play, a play set for children? Do you have a pool? What are you using that for? Or is it just kind of sitting there abandoned and you're not really using it in any way? And then the last thing is, what measures are you taking to try to keep it private? Are you doing anything to try to keep eyes off of it? Are you trying to keep it uh, private? So the court is gonna look at these four factors and the court is going to have to make a determination, is it curtilage or not? And remember, curtilage, yes. Fourth Amendment protection, no curtilage, open fields, no expectation of privacy, no Fourth Amendment protection. Okay, so if you think of it this way, your home is the middle, it's the most protected, solid protection. And then your curtilage is the land surrounding that home. It has some protection more than what your, um, it has less protection than your home, but it still has 
protection under the expectation of privacy. So the home has express Fourth Amendment protections. The curtilage has protections under the expectation of privacy test. But these open areas or public areas do not have any protection. So this is just a visual to help you see it and hopefully stick in your brain. Okay. Now, some of you are probably sitting there thinking, wait a minute, I know this isn't true. And remember, New York can do different things as long as it's giving people more rights. New York does not follow the federal open fields rules if a person actually posts, posts no trespass signs. So even if you have 20 or 50 acres in New York, if you are posting it all with no trespassing signs, it's all protected by the expectation of privacy. So New York is going to give more protections, Fourth Amendment protections, and is going to protect open fields, whereas the federal government will not, okay? So could police walk around a barn located 60 yards from the house, 50 yards from beyond a fence surrounding the house, not used for family purposes, and no measures were taken to hide it from the from the view, okay? So they're not going in the barn right now. They're just walking around. They're walking in the field and they're walking around the barn. So we have to decide, is that where they're walking protected by the Fourth Amendment? We said it was not close to the house. We said there was no fence. We said it's not used for family purposes and that the owner took no steps to try to keep it private. So this would not fall under curtilage. So under the federal rules, police could walk onto the field and walk around the barn if they wanted to, and it would not violate. Now remember in New York, if there was no trespass, then they could not, but under federal rules, they could do it. Now, what about actually entering into the barn? How is that different from them just walking around the outside? Well, the barn itself is an effect. So the actual barn and anything in the barn is an effect and it is expressly protected by the Fourth Amendment. So they cannot enter the barn. They can walk around, they could look through windows, but they could not physically enter the barn or it would be a violation of the Fourth Amendment, okay? Let's talk about some other protected areas. A robbery murder suspect is staying at the house of two women. When police call the home and tell the women that the suspect has to come out, they heard his voice in the background. Without a warrant, they enter the home and arrest the suspect. He claims his Fourth Amendment expectation of privacy rights were violated. Now he's a guest, it's not his home. Do you have an expectation of privacy in someone else's home when you're a guest? Can you claim that the Fourth Amendment violate, was violated by police when they entered the home where you are a guest? It's not your own home. And what the Supreme Court said is if you are an overnight guest, yes, you are protected under the Fourth Amendment. But if you're just there visiting, it is not protected. So how do they know? I don't know. Do you have a suitcase? Do you have a toothbrush? What, you know, what do you have? I guess carry a toothbrush around all the time and then you'll have protection if you say you were staying. So if it is uh, overnight, then you do have Fourth Amendment protections. If it's not, then you do not have Fourth Amendment protections. How about this? You rent a car and park it in your driveway. Do you have an expectation of privacy in a rental car? So you don't own it, it's not your effect. Do you have an expectation of privacy then for the police searching it? And the courts have said, yes. When you rent something and your name is on a rental agreement, you are considered the owner during the time that you are allowed to drive it. So just like the real owner would have an expectation of privacy, you would also because your name is on the rental agreement. You lend your car to someone who is not on the rental agreement. Do they have an expectation of privacy in the car? So you rent it, it's in your name. Your friend says, can I borrow the car? You say, sure. 
driving down the street, the police pull them over and want to search. Do they have an expectation of privacy in that car? Supreme Court said maybe. As long as the driver gave them legal authority to possess the vehicle, they may still have Fourth Amendment protections. Now, obviously, if they took it without permission, they would not. But if they were given permission by the driver, they may have Fourth Amendment protection. And this is a fairly recent case that just came down, Bird versus U.S. Can police subpoena bank records, cell phone numbers, internet provider records without a warrant? So they think you're using your phone, your cell phone, the internet to research or do bad things. Can they call AT&T or Verizon and say, send me their records? And can Verizon send them if they want to? Or does there have to be a warrant? Okay. And what the Supreme Court said is, no, you do not need a warrant. So can police subpoena these records and ask for them without a warrant? Absolutely. The police can call up and say, we want these documents. And what the court has created is what we call third party doctrine. The Supreme Court has said, if you give other people permission to see your records, so there's lots of people that work at Verizon or AT&T and they can all see your records, then you do not have an expectation of privacy in those records. So you don't pass the subjective part of the expectation of privacy test because you're allowing lots of people to see those records. So if police want to and the company agrees, they can hand over those records and it does not violate your Fourth Amendment. Now, most companies won't do it. They'll say, no, we won't do it unless you give us a warrant because they want business. And if they think their, their customers think they're just handing out their private information to anybody that wants it, they're not gonna go to that business anymore. So most businesses won't do it, but they can if they want it. You do not have an expectation of privacy because it's a third party has accessed it, okay? And this is what the doctrine says. We have held repeatedly that the Fourth Amendment does not prohibit obtaining information revealed to a third party and conveyed to by the third party to the government authorities, even if the information is revealed on the assumption that it will only be used for a limited purpose and the confidence placed in the third party will not be betrayed. So if that government third party, at and Verizon, whoever it is, wants to turn it over, they can. But like I said, a lot of times they won't, okay? What about this? Can police, police attach a pen registry to your phone without a warrant to record numbers you dial from that phone, phone? So pen registry does not record conversations. It just knows what numbers you call and what numbers you received calls from. And the Supreme Court said, yes, they can do this. You have no expectation of privacy in the phone numbers that call you or in the numbers you call, okay? So you don't have expectation. Now, it's not the conversations, remember, it's just the actual phone numbers. Does the warrantless search and seizure of cell phone records, which include location and movement of the cell phone users violate the Fourth Amendment? So hopefully you know when you make phone calls now with your cell phone, it dings off of a tower. So there's all these cell phone towers and they can kind of coordinate or they call it triangulate where you are. So it pings off this tower and this tower and you trace it back, you know they were here because it's a triangle. You can trace it back. So can they use your cell phone records and figure out which tower you pinged on to know where you were at any given time? Can they track your location and your movements based on the cell phone towers that your cell phone pings off of. And this came up in Carpenter versus US and it's a pretty recent case. And what the Supreme Court said is cell tower data is protected by the Fourth Amendment because it's more than just phone numbers. It's actually tracking your movement and it's tracking where you are, your location. And this is much more intrusive. We can actually track where you are. 
So we're not going to extend third-party doctrine to these. It's a much more intrusive search. We don't care that you're giving the information over to the cell phone company. We are going to protect it. So you cannot track cell phone tower data, like move to track people's movements and where they are, or that would violate the Fourth Amendment. So let's summarize everything that we learned. So when do you have privacy? When do you have a Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable searches and seizures? We know when it's expressly protected. So persons, houses, papers, and effects, all absolutely protected, okay? We also know that they've expanded on that and you have privacy also Fourth Amendment protections in areas where a reasonable person would expect it to be private and the person tried to keep it private. So the expectation of privacy test. But these are when the court said, no, you do not have an expectation of privacy. So any abandoned property or buildings or anything like that, if it's abandoned, no expectation of privacy. Any conversations that you voluntarily have with somebody, as long as one person um, consents, no expectation of privacy. Remember the false friends doctrine. Now, if they want to follow you in public, if police want to follow you around and just track you in public where you're walking, no expectation of privacy. They're not using anything special. They're just following you around. Open fields, remember, federal rules, no expectation of privacy. And then remember, basic cell phone records and bank records and things like that are not protected because you're disclosing that information to a third party but it does protect location for cell phone data, okay? So that kind of summarizes all that we have. So this was in the recent Byrd case. In the Supreme Court case, Byrd versus US, Justice Thomas wrote in a concurrence, I have serious doubts about the reasonable expectation of privacy test from Katz v. US. So just as some background information, Justice Thomas is a strict, constructionist. He only believes that the Constitution grants rights for things expressly stated. He's not going to interpret it to be broader. So he's going to think the expectation of privacy test is too big because it's not expressly listed in the Constitution, right? He's a strict constructionist. What do you think? Do you like the expectation of privacy test? Do you think the Fourth Amendment should extend two areas that a reasonable person would expect to be private. So I want you to think about that. And that's going to be part of your discussion for this week. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to just take this part of the analysis. So the Fourth Amendment analysis is going to be many steps. We're just starting with the first step today. The only thing we care about is, is the area that's being searched an area where a reasonable person would expect it to be private. So we're gonna do some a protected area problem. So let's try one together. Police suspect Bob of being a member of a sex trafficking organization. They believe he transported girls from New York to Florida on several occasions. They want to use his cell phone records to see if he was in New York and Florida on the dates that correspond to the sex trafficking activities. The police ask AT&T for the records and the company provides them to police without a warrant. Should the records be excluded under the exclusionary rule, a violation of the Fourth Amendment? So our first question is, is this a protected area under the Constitution, under the Fourth Amendment? So all we're looking at is, are, is the information protected in our Constitution, okay? So the first thing we have to dis use is the legal analysis method. So we're gonna keep using this over and over, don't forget. So issue, rule, analysis, conclusion. And remember, we're always taking the defense perspective on it. So the issue is, right, whether the police can use Bob's cell phone records to identify if he was at certain locations during this time. So they want to use these records as evidence. Look, he was in New York, he was in Florida at this time. So he was part of this trafficking. 
is that permitted? Okay. Then we want to look at our rule. We're on the Fourth Amendment right now. So our first part of our rule is always going to be Fourth Amendment. Then we now need to look back at our court cases that we learned in class. So what court cases did we learn about that would help us make this determination? What are our precedents? And then how are we going to apply those precedents to this case? And what is our conclusion? So like I said, the issue is the defendant's cell phone records were obtained illegally by the police and therefore should, they should be excluded as evidence against the defendant at trial, right? They were, so they were obtained in violation of the Fourth Amendment. It was an illegal search and seizure because the cell phone records were protected, right? Now the rule, constitutional amendment, we just list Fourth Amendment search and seizure. The court cases that we talked about that are gonna be helpful, U.S. versus Miller. Generally, Fourth Amendment does not prohibit obtaining information revealed to a third party and conveyed to the third party for government authorities. But we also learned in U.S. versus Carpenter that you cannot use those records for location, right? So we probably would wanna add in U.S. versus Carpenter. So then we get to our analysis. We're going to go step-by-step step through what we just talked about. So the first case is what areas are protected expressly by the Fourth Amendment? So we know the four areas are persons, houses, papers, effects. Well, our cell phone tower records, persons, houses, papers, effects? No, okay. So what areas are expressly protected? Persons, houses, papers, effects. Where did the police search? In this case, they searched cell phone records. Was this area one of those four expressly protected areas, persons, houses, papers, effects? No, it is not. But then our last question is, is it still fall under the expectation of privacy test? Would a reasonable person expect their location to be kept private? And did this person try to keep it private? Now under the US versus Carpenter case, Yes, a reasonable person would expect their location to be kept private. And this person tried to, they didn't turn over the records voluntarily to the police. So these are the questions you're gonna answer in your analysis section, literally step-by-step step, answer each of these questions. And then restate your conclusion. Since the police illegally obtained the defendant's cell phone records for location, they should be excluded as evidence against the defendant at trial, okay? So there are a bunch of problems that I posted online. I would suggest that you work on them on your own and see if you can answer them. And then once you do, look and compare them to the key. Do they, um, did you do the right thing? And it also will show you a good format and that's the format you're going to use for part one of your chapter three assignment. So remember, when you're doing your chapter three assignment, all you're doing is deciding, is this a protected area, okay? That's all you wanna do. All you wanna know is, is this a protected area? That's all the analysis that you're going to use, okay? Now, I also posted a Fourth Amendment on, um, assessment on Blackboard that you can take. Um, and then you're gonna do your chapter three protected area. Part one is the protected area assignment, okay? So hopefully all that makes sense. Again, just like always, it can get confusing. So if you have any questions, please reach out and ask me. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, but just remember for part one, all you're trying to assess is, is it a protected area? That's the only question you want to answer, okay? I'll see you soon.